Welcome to You Are From God, where we open the Bible and learn to see the image of God in ourselves and the people around us. I'm Scott Taylor. And I'm Tyler Hall. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back to You Are From God. Today's episode, Scott, we're going to talk about prayer. Obviously, this is an awesome thing that the child of God enjoys and has the opportunity to take a part of in every single day. It's something that even from the world, uh, people who do not believe necessarily in the Bible, but um, the concept of prayer appealing to a higher power is something that uh, comes up and is understood. But what we want to talk about today, Scott, is how Jesus talks about prayer in this section of passage uh, of the scriptures with Matthew chapter 7, and just the relationship that's reflected there. Uh, It is awesome that we, as children of God, can talk to God about anything. Um, Today we want to look at those, specifically these prayers of what the Bible will call supplication, that simply the idea that we're making requests of God, we're asking him for things or for his assistance. And for the true child of God, asking the Father what we need and want is an amazing opportunity, but we have to understand what it means to do that properly. Yeah, and and to your point, this is something that we can just overlook how blessed we are to be able to talk to him at any time. There's no one on this earth that you can just pick up your phone or whatever and just talk to them at any particular moment. They may be sleeping. There's other things that are going on. You certainly can't just contact the White House and talk to the president just because you want to. But to be able to talk to the God of all things and him wanting to talk to us Mm -hmm. and ask of things, to your point, it's just so awesome. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is... I'm going to end this sermon, which he's talking about the relationship that we have with God, the relationship we have with one another. In verse 7, he says, ask, and of chapter 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or what person is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? So if you despite if so if you despite being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him just a beautiful passage from the standpoint of him actually wanting to give us these things to be able to take care of us and to hear from us and the opportunity we have to pray to him well and he compares it to the parent child relationship it's all based on that the idea they are asking seeking knocking it's this promise that god hears the prayers of his people And that he's going to fulfill those things. We can spend a lot of time, and this is probably future episodes, just the idea of how we ask, what we're asking for, and God's response to those things. The yes, the no, the not yet. All the different ways that God can address those things. But it's always based, and Jesus is trying to get us to understand this basis, of a child appealing to a parent. It's based on a loving parental relationship with the Lord. And so when we ask God for these things, understanding that we can ask God for these amazing blessings, and he, he makes it very clear, look, you know as parents what it's like when a child asks you for something and you you want to give it to them. If a kid comes up to you and asks for something to eat, you're not going to give them something that's going to harm them. Not only can they not eat, but it's going to be of, of a detriment or, or a risk to them. Luke's account, in addition to talking about these different uh, discussions, right, the the um, the bread and the stone or the fish and the serpent, uh, Luke's account in Luke 11, 11 through 13, will have the idea of if a child asks for an egg, you're not going to give them a scorpion, are you? So it's just, again, just one more iteration of mm-hmm. that same idea of we're asking for these good things. And God's saying, look, you understand that you don't just give the child bad things. And so for him to understand, for us to understand that of God, to realize When I ask God good things, he doesn't want to harm me. He doesn't want bad things. He wants to give me good things. It reminds me, Scott, of James chapter 1 and verse 17, where it talks about every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. In context, it's talking about temptation. You know, God's not going to tempt you with evil. He himself is tempted by no one. The idea of where sin actually comes from is our own desires are pointed in the wrong way. But this is an awesome idea that all these good things that we experience in life, even people who don't believe God exists, get to benefit from the good and perfect gifts of his creation. The idea of, of experiences and, and the life that we have and the things we get to see and do, all of those things can bless us immensely. They should point us to acknowledging the one who gives us those things and the one who made us, but ultimately we have that choice to make. But what I want to spend a little time talking about here, Scott, is the idea of this parent-child dynamic and what the child actually asks for. Because in Jesus' example, he's saying the kids are asking for these the ways of sustaining themselves. They're looking for fish, for bread, for eggs. It's, it's food. 
But what if we're not asking for bread or fish or eggs, metaphorically, in our prayers? What if when God's people are going to him, and, and you listening now, if when you're going to God, you're asking for something, and you understand that this would be a blessing to me, this would sustain me, this is going to be something that's so good for me, but what if, spiritually speaking, from God's perspective, we're asking for scorpions and serpents and stones without even realizing it? This is a hard thing to process because, again, we have our limited perspective of this one thing, this one prayer that I've been asking over and over again, this is the thing I think I need. And it very well could be, but appreciating that it's a child asking the father these things puts us in a role of humility, I think. And we just have to realize, you know what, maybe this job that I'm seeking after, or maybe this person that I'm pursuing in a relationship, or maybe this idea of what Uh, success looks like to me, or this thing that I think will solve all my problems, it's actually going to do me more harm than good, spiritually speaking, because I might just be thinking from the material as one example. And so I think I'm asking God for a good thing. I'm asking for bread, when in reality, I'm asking for a a stone, and it's not going to do me any good at all. Yeah, it's hard sometimes to really understand trust and what true ultimate trust is. So we understand it from the parent standpoint you obviously as a parent understand a little bit more than what your child is just asking for something whether they need it or not and there are times where that child really thinks he needs it to your point Mm -hmm. and the parent knows better or should know better our god definitely knows better Mm -hmm. and and so sometimes when we ask of things it's not what we need and even though you are adamant that that's absolutely what i need at the time i always think of first john the fifth chapter where he'll talk about us being confident when we talk to to God in prayer in verse 14 it says this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will mm-hmm. he hears us that phrase according to his will is so unbelievably important it's not the idea of Uh, A genie, as an example, we're just asking God for whatever we want. He's going to give us our wishes and grant us our wishes, and we're just going to have whatever we would like to have. This is the idea of it being according to his will, us truly trusting that the answer that's going to be give yes, no, or wait um, is the correct answer, mainly because it's from God, right? So Mm -hmm. it is obviously the correct answer. It may not be what you want, and many times it's not going to be what you want, but a lot of times it's because we don't understand what we are asking, perhaps, or what the purpose or the reason is behind why we're not getting what we what we think we might need when the reality is we don't actually need what we're talking about. And you see this, whether it's with Jesus on the cross, you see this with Paul asking about the thorn uh, in his flesh, all the different things and how God answers the question and what the ultimate reason for not taking those things away was in those different circumstances is the same for us. We may not understand it, but do we trust him? And that's the key for us as his children, understanding to the verses that we've been reading, um, that he's going to answer according to what is best for us, according to what is best for, in his view, for his children. And that's ultimately all that I need to really believe and understand and to trust in. Yeah, I mean, Second Corinthians 12 is a powerful one where Paul's asking for him to remove that thorn in the flesh. And you think, Paul, can I, I can do so much more for you, God. I can serve you. I can, I, you know, this this thing is going to actually hinder me from serving you more. But uh, Paul will actually write in 2 Corinthians 12 that it was to keep him from becoming conceited. He had some perspective now on what that thorn was about and maybe an understanding of why God didn't take it away. But even just the idea of how God responds to him as an apostle in the first century, right, that he can speak to him and Paul can record this awesome idea that we can take comfort in. My power is made perfect in weakness. Even if you think that this is the answer that needs to happen— you got to appreciate God and understanding his wisdom and his all-knowing and the all-power and the fact that the the place where you're trying to get might not be exactly where God wants you to be. And so he's not going to put something in, a, in your path that's going to um, be a detriment ultimately or, or cause you to stumble or tempt you again, right? That idea that God's not going to be a tempter and he's not tempted by anyone from James 1. But the awesome opportunity with all this, Scott, is kind of going back to Luke's account of this same 
conversation Jesus has around prayer in Luke 11, 11 through 13, where in verse 13, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So in Matthew's account, it was God knows how to give you good things. Obviously, God wants to give you good things. Here, Luke will phrase it from Jesus' standpoint of the conversation actually goes to the Holy Spirit. And so what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, it gives insight and an understanding of God's will. And we see that through the scriptures as the Spirit works through the scriptures. We see that obviously in the revelation of the scriptures as the Holy Holy Spirit works in the first century, all these different pieces that come out of how the Holy Spirit part of God works. But that's where we need to get to the idea of we're praying for thy will be done. I'm trying to pursue the things that God genuinely wants for me. And I need to be in my prayer life growing to this point where I can say, God, this is what I really think I need. Paul still prayed three times for that thorn to be removed. This is, this is genuinely what I think I need and what I think would be best, but I understand that I am limited in my understanding and in my power and all these things. God, you know what's best. And so it's about your will. It's about um, if this is going to be bad for me, if this is going to cause me to stumble, if this is, even though from this side of things looks like what I need, if you know better, God, and I'm going to trust that you're going to put the right thing in the right time in front of me, then I'm going to be content. And that's ultimately what Paul will talk about as well, this learning contentment that it's God who strengthens us. And for me, Scott, going to Psalm 37, I think, is this big point of understanding how we pray and and the desires of our heart. You talk about these children desiring the bread and the stone and the egg and how we can accidentally or intentionally be desiring scorpions and serpents and stones, maybe if realizing it, maybe not. But the idea is that we should, at the end of the day, be desiring God and his goodwill. Psalm 37 and verse 4 is a powerful one to me just because I think people can read it, and if you're not acquainted with the rest of Scripture or or knowing God, it seems like a, a vending machine sort of verse, but it's the actual exact opposite. Psalm 37 and verse 4 simply says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that, oh, I really have been praying for this Porsche, and so I'm going to delight myself in God, and then he's going to give me the Porsche. It's actually the idea that you have to put first things first. The first part of that verse says, I'm going to find my delight. The satisfaction of my desires are in the Lord, and he's going to now give me the desires of my heart. Well, my desires are now different. I've I've been changed. I've been transformed. It's actually God himself who's going to meet those things. And I think this goes into the conversation that we've had before, Scott, where we cannot lose sight of the giver or the one who blesses for the blessings or the gifts. And we get so fixated on those, realizing that whatever we might receive from God, it is it is good, and he will make it to our benefit, and he works all things together for good according to his purposes, as Romans 8, 28 will talk about. Yeah, it's interesting in verse 5 that of Psalm 37, he'll go on and talk about trust, right? I mean, you're going to have this absolute trust, understanding his will, being willing to actually say, thy will be done, and mean it. That's the danger. <laughs> Sometimes we might be willing to say, your will be done, but to truly understand what that means is I'm giving you the trust. I think of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, Um, where really the great weapon that we have, and he mentions a lot of the armor, obviously, and and one of the weapons that we have is this prayer. But he says, with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit, going back to uh, Luke, the 11th chapter, Mm -hmm. and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance in every request for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with the boldness of the mystery of the gospel. And he continues on to modern being an ambassador, but you see the significance of prayer and you see the idea of God's people willing to turn to God, trust him that he's hearing my prayer, that he's going to answer my prayer. And it's going to be the correct answer based on his will, not mine. And that is hard. You know, that's, that's the continuing to work on my relationship with him and my absolute trust in the creator of all things. And if we have that kind of attitude and understanding what it truly means to be a child and that he's doing everything to, to be a help to us, to get us to heaven, to be with him for eternity. And he loves us so much that he's wanting to give us the bread. He's wanting uh, to give us the egg or the fish, not the, not the wrong things. But to your point that you made earlier, I think it's so accurate. Sometimes we're the ones asking for the scorpion and the snake, and we have to be really careful. And that's it goes back to the relationship, praying in the spirit, praying according to his will. This is a conversation. Relationships are built on communication. We see that with any other relationship in our lives. 
And it's certainly true of God. Again, the reflection of these relationships is pointing us to an understanding of how we relate and have an interaction with God. It's based on communication. And so if I'm just constantly talking and only listening for things that I want to hear or what I think I should hear, then that's no good. I could be asking for something that's sinful, right? And if I don't know God's will, if I'm not listening to his word before I pray, and if I don't go back to his word after I pray to read this this will of God— then I very well might be asking for a crocodile that's just totally going to devour me, right? Forget snakes and scorpions. But that's the beautiful thing is it's a conversation. It's listening to God's word, praying in the spirit, praying the way he wants me to, and learning from not just my prayers, but going back to his word and seeing how his word addresses my prayers and how he might answer prayers in the circumstances of life, whether it's soon after I pray, whether it's later on down the line or whether there's a lesson there that I have to learn like Paul did with a thorn in the flesh. So listen, as you're listening to this program today, I hope that's been of an encouragement for you in your prayer life. If you're striving to be God's child, first of all, go into his word, listen to him, understand the truth that he's revealed in the scriptures. And secondly, as you continue that conversation in the back and forth with God, as you go to him in prayer, keep these things in mind. Really ask yourself, am I asking for good things from God? The things that God says are good, the metaphorical eggs and bread uh, and fish. Or just have an honest conversation with yourself and with God of realizing, you know what, I think these things are good, but maybe I'm actually asking for scorpions and serpents and stones. And be ready in that sense, if that's what you discover, to trust God to that conversation that we've had, that he is going to give us all good things because we are his children and you are from God. Thanks for listening. Show your support by leaving a review on your podcast app and share this episode with someone you want to encourage. If you have questions or would like to get in touch with us, go to youarefromgod.com. That's youarefromgod.com.